the webcasting is now working, so um, just be aware that this will uh, be, be broadcast live. But they'll only get the backs of your heads by and large. John is now going to tell us all about the wonders of the Ryerson Index. I think we're aware of, I've had so many questions out there about contemporary newspapers and how we negotiate that period post 1954. So you're really going to want to hear what John's got to say. Thanks, John. Thanks, Stephanie. Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. Is there anyone here that hasn't heard of Ryerson before? Wow. Who hasn't, what? Who hasn't heard of Ryerson, the Ryerson oh, Index? No, I, no, I haven't. <laughs> I'm dumb. No, not. Well, okay. A brief, the brief introduction then. Um, the Sydney Dead Person Society in 1998 was looking for a project that could involve as many members as possible. And we put forward the idea of what about indexing death notices out of the Sydney Morning Herald and put them on the web. Great idea, great idea they thought. And so it wasn't called the Ryerson Index at that stage, it was actually called the Sydney DPS Indexing Project. So you're all glad, I bet, that we actually changed the name later. <laughs> that, was, that was the start of it. We, we started with the Sydney Morning Herald and the Daily Telegraph. We expanded to some country papers as people got interested and said, I can in index my own local paper for this if you like. Great, we'll take it. And then we ended up with a website that is not quite the one you see today. It was much more basic than this. But within six months of start, or eight months of starting, we met a lady called Joyce Ryerson. Joyce came along to the Sydney DPS meeting in May 1999 and said, um, I've got a few papers that you might want to index. Oh, what have you got? I've got all the death notices out of the Sydney Morning Herald for the last 14 years. Wow. <laughs> we wanted to index them. And we did. It took us, it took us three years to get through all those, those notices. But that was the, the real impetus that got Ryerson moving both backwards and forwards. At that, when, we, when we first started, our initial aim was we will index current death notices only and move forward. But with, with Joyce's donation, we went backwards for 14 years and that's it. We've never stopped since. So we now cover most of, most of the Sydney Morning Herald. We have a gap from about 1920 to around about 1950, roughly. But all the other notices are covered. So we, we owe a lot to Joyce, as the, and that, that, that is why it's obviously called the, the Ryerson Index. So let's have a look at what, what the index actually covers. On the, on the front page there, you'll see the standard menu bar down the side, a little, little bit of information in the, in the middle, the all-important search button over the, to the right. Down the bottom of the centre panel there, we have a, a brief summary by decade. Unfortunately, I couldn't get all the numbers in for the, for the, uh, on the screenshot I had, um, where we, we just give a brief summary of how many notices we have included for, by decade. And the, the interesting numbers are that from 2000 onwards, we have over 2 million entries. And they're, they're the contemporary records that are otherwise quite hard to find. Some states have some indexes going past the past trove, past the end of their BDM indexes. New South Wales, for instance, has the probate index that goes to 1985. Um, but given that their, their death indexes on, on, the, on the BDM side are now up to 1982, the value of the uh, of the probate index is getting less and less every year and in, in another three years it will be of fairly limited value. But our strength really is in the, moderns, the modern notices, the, the ones that are, are difficult to find. So let's have a look at what we cover. We list, each, each paper we index is listed here. This is the summary page that shows the paper how many notices we have indexed and what the latest date 
is that we have indexed for that paper. For the capital cities, we've covered, we cover most of them. Um, Darwin's a little bit light because we don't have anybody up there that, that uh, is keen to index all the time. We have one part-time indexer who travels a lot. Sydney Morning Herald obviously being the first paper we started is 1.6 million and, and steaming ahead. Melbourne 617,000 there on the Herald Sun. Even the Courier Mail 163,000. If we look at an individual paper, we show, the, we show what details we can find about the publication history of that paper because most papers, even though they're dailies these days, did not start out as dailies. And so it's, it's important to know when they became, went from a weekly to a bi-weekly to a tri-weekly to a daily. We show the number of notices by a particular notice type that we have indexed. This is useful in, if, you're, if you're looking, for instance, for an obituary in, in Brisbane. You know we've got 2,000 odd obituaries from the Courier Mail covering the period 2003 to 2013. So if the one you want may very well be in there. Down the bottom, the little link that says details of date indexed is the most important page for each newspaper because that shows every date that we have indexed for that paper. So the Courier-Mail started out, we've, we've, we've got a few scattered issues, 49, 10th of January, 7th of February 1952, but by the time we get up to the recent notices, we're pretty well up to date. And the, the Courier-Mail, for instance, is complete from 2003 onwards. So it's important that when you can't find a notice that you think is in a particular paper, you go and look at the dates indexed for that paper, because it may very well be that the, the date that the notice you want is on a an issue that we have not yet indexed. That's the, the biggest, um, the largest number of que queries we get is, I can't find Uncle Fred's death notice. I know it was in the Courier Mail, I know it was in the Sydney Morning Herald, whatever. Um, and when they give us the date, we can, say, we can quick, very quickly say, well, we haven't indexed it yet, that's why you can't find it, but give us time. And if you want it quicker, would you like to become an indexer? <laughs> So within Queensland, we have a, a good range of, of country papers. Um, the strength at the moment in Ryerson is obviously New South Wales where we started, but Queensland is now running the second as the, in terms of, of numbers of papers that are, that are being included. And that's just a small, small selection. We list them alphabetically by town. Um, so Ryerby Island, so Joe, we're ready for you. <laughs> as soon as you can get started. The all-important search button. This is probably the, the, the key to most people's use of Ryerson. And what we found when we had our, um, our record counter on the front page was that a lot of people had bookmarked the search page and not the front page. And so we moved the counter to the search page and suddenly we were getting twice as many hits. <laughs> because it is, it is a little bit dangerous to do that. We always encourage people to go straight to the front page because if we ever change anything, your search page bookmark may no longer be applicable. Not that we're planning on doing that at the moment, but uh, it could happen. Searching is very simple. Um, the second page of the handout shows uh, examples of how to, uh, how to, how to use the, the surnames and the, and the given name fields. Surname must be present. We do occasionally come across some notices, or, or the odd notice, where it's just Alfred or Mary. We obviously can't index those because you could never search for them anyway. They don't have a surname. There's not many. We've probably found, I suppose, 10 in, um, in what, uh, 14 years. So they, they don't happen all that often. So 
you can get away with just putting in a surname and searching on that. Um, you may get a lot of results. So it's preferable, I guess, if you can go, go with a given name. Um, have a look at the handouts as to the, the best way to use the given name and we'll show you some of the, the, the sneaky ways as we go through this demonstration. Okay, let's have a look at a couple of examples. What happens when someone gets a bit carried away or some parents get a bit carried away and they, they would like to um, include a few Christian names in the, in the, for the poor child? Patricia Frith was Patricia, Margaret, Catherine, Rutherford and a bit more, starting with C. When we set up the database, we thought, oh, yeah, this, yeah we'll make, the, data, make the, the, the given names about 40 characters long. That'll be plenty. There's always one, isn't there? In this case, we were lucky because we had some, some room. Uh, there was no, no location details given for this lady, so we, had, we could put a note over in the location details that say the final, final given names are Charteris McColl. So she actually had six Christian names. If you notice there, our comment is in square brackets. That's, the, that's a, a very important distinction. Anything at all you find in Ryerson that is in square brackets is our comments. It is not part of the original notice. And we go, we'll go into that, how we correct errors in, in a couple of minutes, but that's, that's basically how we do it. We, we, we indicate using square brackets. So. We have plenty of famous people in there too. I'm sure you've heard of John Gorton. Surprisingly though, he didn't get all that many mentions when he died. Well, not in the papers we've indexed anyway. Only the, the Telegraph, the Herald and the Courier Mail seem to be too interested. But there was another, another fellow, um, anybody heard of Bernie Banton? Very. Yes, yes, the James Hardy Betmire. Bernie was known as Bernie, he was known as Bernard. So how do we search for that and get them all in one hit? We picked the common letters. The B-E-R-N part of Bernie and Bernard. And that will give us 12 notices for him. Ranging from Bernard Douglas, Bernard Douglas done as Bernie, down to straight old Bernie. But because we can use that short section of his given name, we can pick up all the combinations. And in his case, he was well known all, basically all around the eastern states. So five, five papers covered his, his death. And from the information there, you can find out quite a lot about him. This was a lady who was... Um, I guess you could say lucky in that she had advance notice of her death. The, the paper, Herald Sun, published on the 3rd of December that the lady was going to die on the 30th of December. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> again, this is one where we can pick it up. Our database updating software flags these cases as being wrong, so we can then go in and add a comment. So we put our, our own square brackets comment in there to to reflect the fact that uh, there is a mistake. But if you look at the, entrance of the entry above, you'll see that two days later on the 5th of December, they published, they published a correction and got it right this time. And it should have actually been the 30th of November. But from our point of view, all we saw, all we could see when we're indexing one entry is the fact that it says the 30th of December. Now we know it's wrong, but we don't know how wrong. So we can't take a guess at what it could be. We could say, oh, it should logically have been the 30th of November, but we don't know. It's the 3rd of December. It may have been meant to be the 1st of December. We can't tell. So we, we, we cannot make any assumptions as to what correct values might be. All we can do is flag the fact that it is a wrong value. It's then up to the researcher to, to make the, draw their own conclusions from, from what they see. This is a... This is a sneaky little check that I, a, a sneaky little search that I just want to use as an example. Whoa. <laughs> when we find a, a misspelling mistake in the location, we put probably should be this in there in square brackets. 
So if you look at the first entry there for James Edwin Brown, back in 1899 with manual typesetting, it wasn't that difficult to get, to get a U and turn it upside down to make it an N. And so Maryborough suddenly becomes Maryborong. Now if anyone was searching on Browns in Maryborough, they wouldn't find that entry because it was spelt as Maryborong. So when we notice that it is misspelt, we put in what we think is the correct spelling. And by putting it in there, it means that Maryborough is now a valid location for that entry. So if anybody now searches on the Brown entry in Maryborough, by saying, show me all the Browns in Maryborough between 1890 and 1899, There he is, both incorrect spelling and correct spelling. So where we can, we correct the, the mistakes, but it really comes down to whether the, the indexer is alert enough to, to pick these up. Um, and it also comes down to the fact that the indexers make mistakes. It may have been originally correctly spelt as Maryborough and the indexer has mistyped it. There's not much we can do about that unless we find it. In which case, we find if, we, if someone points out that there is a spelling mistake, we go back, we check the notice. If it's incorrect in the notice, we flag it like this in the square brackets. If it's not, if the index has made a mistake, we correct it. Simple as that. This is an example of how to use Ryerson to tie in with other resources to carry out quite a detailed search. The Necht family is, number one, easy to find because there's not many of them, and number two, a, a local family to the, the Darling Downs. We found the, in the Toowoomba Chronicle in 2003 the death of a Maori Necht on the 2nd of December, 2003. So within Ryerson, we include a list of other public resources that, that are available to you at home for free. If you look in there, we have a number of different types of resources, but we have two that are particularly valuable. They're the, they're the ones that we suggest that you try first. One of them is the Australian Cemeteries Index. <coughs> is anybody familiar with this website? It's a marvellous website. It was created by a fellow called Reg MacDonald at lives at Mudgee. Uh, Reg was at one of our indexes for quite a while. He indexed the Mudgee Guardian for about 40 or 50 years, going backwards. But Reg and his wife have travelled over most of outback, well, inland New South Wales, southern Queensland and into country Victoria, photographing headstones in cemeteries. And they just go to a cemetery and they photograph every headstone in beautiful detail. So if we go to that website, which at the moment contains about 325,000 entries, and it's, it's, I think it's pretty well um, reached its, its limit because Reg is now at the, at the stage where it's, it's a bit difficult to, to travel around too much more. So uh, I think this is probably as many as we'll have in there. Um, but there is a name search available. We click on the name search, we just enter the name. Six entries spread around, well, in fact, all in Nobby General Cemetery, a true Darling Downs family. But there's Morris John, died 2nd of December 2003. If we click on the, the Nobby General icon, we get a transcription of what is on the the headstone, and if we clicked on the little camera icon at the side, there it is, the headstone. 325,000 of these, it's a, it's a brilliant site. But it's also easily accessible when you can get a death date or a location or a name or anything else out of Ryerson. Take, take those details into the Australian Cemeteries Index site 
and there it is. You may very well find the headstone that you want. The other one that we recommend is called Australian Cemeteries. It's a bit of a, I guess, an add-on to Australian Cemeteries Index. If you go into this one, it's a, it's a fairly neat website. It's organised by state, state, states down the side. If we pick on pick Queensland, you then within each state you can then select by the initial letter of each of the town you want. If we look for the for the T's, for instance, they've got details of Tabinga Homestead, Tabinga Lutheran Cemetery, Talagala Cemetery, Tabletop Cemetery, Tambo, Tambourine Mountain, Tambrookham, Tansy. Take your pick. There are lots of country cemeteries in this um, in this website. The detail, however, varies considerably. It, it depends entirely on who has done the work. Uh, in a lot of cases, the local societies have, have transcribed their cemeteries and put them up here. Those with the Kemmer icons, for instance, will have uh, at least some pictures of the, the cemetery. It may just be an overall picture of the cemetery rather than individual headstones. But until you look, you just don't know what's there. Some do have provision, for instance, Tambourine Mountain has provision there to, to provide lookups. So if you can click on the lookup link, you may very well, if you, need, if you know there is somebody in Tambourine Mountain Cemetery you want, there may be a way to get a, a lookup done. But we, we, we think that, that is a, those two sites are very useful as complementary sites to Ryerson. So what happens once you've found an entry in Ryerson and you you would like to see the notice. Many choices, many choices. Some of these we've gone through already with Stephanie. Trove is the obvious one. If you've got a, an entry in the, within the Trove period, look there first if the paper is, has been, has been um, scanned. Google Archives is another one. Anybody familiar with Google Archives and how they handle newspapers? OK, we'll go into that in a, in a couple of slides. New South Wales State Library, we've mentioned that briefly, the Fairfax Archive going up to, um, to 1990 and the Fairfax, Archi the Fairfax website itself has some notices. They, they're more a commercial site in that they, they like people to pay to keep the, the notices, which they call tributes, um, sitting online. Um, some people have done it, That's, and again, it's worth a look if, you, if you're looking for a, a notice that was published in the Fairfax paper, go and look in the Fairfax archive uh, the, on, their, on their website. And if all else fails, ask us. We'll, we'll see what we can do. <coughs> Trove, we, want, we don't need to go back through that again. It's, uh, everybody knows it, everybody loves it. Google newspapers. There's the address. It's all on the website, so you don't need to, to write too much down. And Google has both the Sydney Morning Herald and the Melbourne Age included. They go right back to the start, which is a bit of a duplication of Trove. The trouble with Google is that they're nowhere near as easy to search as Trove. You can't just do a search and it returns you, here's all the, the issues that have, that have the, the result in it. You have to know the date of the issue that you want to look at. And the big problem that we have there with Google is the way that they have digitised their paper. The papers were, that were obtained from the Fairfax archives and Google took the, the easy way out. When Fairfax scanned the, the archive to give to New South Wales State Library, Fairfax scanned individual pages. When Google scanned them, they scanned two, two pages at a time. And so because the papers are bound together in large volumes, you find the last page of one date and the first page of the next date are together in a Google scan. And so the death notices, of course, are always on the last page, aren't they? Well, they have been since about 1940 anyway. And so it's a real trap in that you go looking for the issue that you want, you flip through looking for the death notices and you get to the end of the issue and there are no death notices. You've got to go to the next date and, look and go backwards. We have here, the date up the top is January the 2nd. So that we're looking at the issue of January the 2nd, 1970. 
But this is page 30 of January the 1st, where they have the notices. That in itself is a bit of a frustration, but it gets worse. Because Google does not scan every day, they scan lots of days, they seem to have a bit of a, um, a dislike to Saturdays, for instance, which is unfortunate because Saturday, the Saturday Herald usually contains more death notices than any other day. I think it's because of the volumes and the, of the classifiers and everything. They just figure that there is, there's more bang for their buck in, in scanning smaller editions than there is doing Saturday editions. And so, of course, because there were very few Saturdays, we lose the Friday notices. Sundays, the, Saturday, the Sydney Morning Herald is not published as the Sydney Morning Herald. It's published as the Sun Herald. They scan those separately. So there is no back page of Saturday's paper either. <laughs> so you can end up in Google with maybe three or four sets of days of notices per week on a good week. Frustrating, but better than nothing. And it is free and you can do it from home. New South Wales State Library, if you're lucky enough to get, have a card, and Joe said, pointed out earlier that they have relaxed the restrictions, have they, Joe, to... Okay, so that it's, if it's worth, if you're looking for, for New South Wales papers, it's worth, particularly the Herald, it's worth getting a New South Wales card. Same basis as Queensland, you just apply, and that's it. They go up to 1995, um, so, and they do have every issue scanned. Then, if, you need, if, you, if you're still struck out, you can always ask for Ryerson. We don't have every notice we've ever indexed. That would be a little bit hard to keep with you know, almost four million notices. That's a lot of paper. But we do have scans of around about a million of those notices. And what we've done is ask for volunteers within the group of, of indexes to carry out lookups on the basis of looking up a year at a time. So one person will have all the scans for the Sydney Morning Herald for 1970, someone else will have all the scans for the Sydney Morning Herald for 1971, uh, someone else has them all for 1972, that sort of thing. And this request form is automatically directed to the person who has the, the paper and the date that you ask for. So if you're stuck and you need a notice, go in and request one and see what happens. You've got about a one in four chance of, of, of success. Um, if, you don't get, if it's not successful, you'll get a message saying there is no one available that, that can cover this particular period. But you may be lucky. Have we got anybody enthusiastic enough now to volunteer to be an indexer? It's really easy. If anybody wants to be an indexer, we, we supply the software. You can come in there today and download it if you want to and try it out, play around with it, read the rules for formatting records. Just play around with your local paper if you like and see what happens. And then if you're really interested, contact us. We have a short training course. We put all indexes through. You get two attempts to pass it. Um, we've, we've had probably half a dozen people over the 10 years or so we've, we've used that training course that haven't managed to pass in two attempts. Um, everybody else doesn't seem to find it too hard. And once, you re once you've passed the, t the training, then you you've got a choice. You can index your local paper if that's not being indexed. You can join a team of back indexes that, that we have a good supply of, of scans of, of papers from around the country that we need indexed. So please, if you're, if you're interested, have a look. We've also joined the, the world, basically, and uh, decided social media is, um, I guess, a necessary evil. And it's no real secret that I guess the average age of, of indexes is probably on the, the wrong side of 60. Um, but it's surprising, a lot of people of that, of that age use Facebook anyway, as I do, to keep in touch with the kids and the grandkids. It's, it's the best way. So we have a Facebook page. We update it 
at least every week. We've got 626 people who think we're pretty good at the moment and like us. <laughs> and we've got a few people who make some comments every now and again. Like, uh, I can't get in there today. What's happening? Is the site down? <laughs> but we prefer to look at the, the comments that say something like, excellent, thanks for doing such a great job. <laughs> Thank you. So there is a, you know, it's, it's worth, worth a look if, there, if you've got nothing, nothing better to do than play around on Facebook. <laughs> okay, where do we see us going in the future? That's the, that's the interesting question. We see that there are five, five key areas. Obviously the first one is that once we have a paper in Ryerson as we do now, we want to keep indexing it. It's, it's quite frustrating for us if we have someone who come a lot, comes along and says, I want to index the, the Buller Mechanica Gazette. And they do it for a year, two years, and then just quietly disappear. It's surprising how many indexes just do quietly disappear. They don't actually say that they've, they're not going to do it anymore. They just stop doing it. And, um, and that then leaves us with a, a stub of a paper sitting in, the, in Ryerson. And by the time we work out that there's no more indexing coming through, we've got a, quite a gap if we can find a new indexer to take over. So we try hard to, to keep the, the flow of of current papers as, as up-to-date as possible. Because the, the more up-to-date we, we have them, the quicker we can work out that there is a, there is a problem and we need to plug that gap. But that, that is our, I guess, our real reason for being there, to index the current papers. And so that's the, that's the, the, the main focus that we, we will always be concentrating on. We also want to include papers that are not currently in Ryerson whenever we can, whenever we get the opportunity. There are something like 750 newspapers in print today in Australia. It's a surprising number, but when you think about papers like The Australian, The Fin Review, The Land, lots of little country, little suburban papers that don't carry any sort of notices whatsoever. So while there might be 750 papers in print, our target is probably 500, I suppose, at, the, at a realistic um, level. <coughs> a lot of that 500 would probably be papers that may have one or two notices a week. So because we're covering all the major capital dailies at the moment, we probably cover about 75, 80% of, of deaths uh, that happen in Australia that, that are published as death notices. The, the, the whole issue of um, whether or, or the, the decline in the number of notices being published is a, is a separate question because there, there might be, um, oh, in round figures, there might be 100,000 deaths registered in Australia in, in a year, but there may only be 25,000 death notices. And that's, a, that's just a fact of life that we, we have really no control over. Um, the, the, the number of notices being published has declined significantly since we, even since we started. And we, we have figures on the website. If you go into the Sydney Morning Herald or into, the, into the, the link that says some statistics, we can show you figures back to the 1950s of the Sydney papers and how the decline has happened in the the, uh, the number of notices that are, that are being published. So we try to include those other papers, even though they're only small papers, so that we can, we can at least pick up all the possible um, published notices. Uh, but, but I think we've currently got around about 75 or 80% of the, of the notices that are being, being published. Obviously, once we've got a paper that's, that starts a new indexer comes along and says, I want to index my local paper, it's not being done yet, great, you can start now. We find that most indexers fairly quickly take a liking to the, to the idea that, hey, I'm actually contributing something here. 
I could go back to the go down to the library or the paper office or whatever, and I could get some back issues and do those too, couldn't I? You bet you could. And in that way, we've we've had people take papers back decades. I mentioned earlier Reg McDonald. He was he was probably the first person that did that started doing this on a serious basis. And he got the Mudgy Guardian back to 1960 um, fairly quickly. But our our best effort at the moment is the Lismore Northern Star. Um, one indexer came along there, I'm not even sure how many years ago, probably close to 10, I suppose, now. Started doing it, doing the current issues, thought he'd do the, got, got enthusiastic, thought he'd go backwards. He's now back to 1931 <coughs> and ploughing backwards quite rapidly. <laughs> and that, that, beca the, that became a... a um, a really useful archive because prior to the Northern Star going on to Trove, his scans of all those death notices were the only available um, copies outside the libraries. And uh, the local, the Richmond Tweed Historical Society was, was quite happy when we donated a set of scans of all their, all their death notices for the last 60 years. And, um, and this was all thanks to one fellow. It's, who doesn't even want to be named. <laughs> so yes, we, we do try and go back. We, we, have, we have any, any indexer that, that, that is enthusiastic enough to want to take their paper backwards, we're quite happy to accommodate it. And obviously we're happy to take papers if, if someone has an interest. We, we've had a number of, of indexers come along and say, I know I'm indexing paper A, but I have this real interest in the in the area around Scone or Nowra or Broken Hill and I'm, I'll be researching in the, the, the papers there now they're on Trove, do you want me to index them? Of course we do. <laughs> We've never knocked back anybody yet. <laughs> and so we end, this is how we end up with a lot of little clusters for some papers. It's some, some indexer has been doing their own research and they've, they've gone that little, little extra step and added the the data for us. That's why we have the Sydney Gazette from 1803, for instance. We can, we can say we have, we index from the start of newspapers in Australia. <laughs> but of course, the main, um, our main objective is, as we've always been, to maintain Ryerson as a free resource for all genealogists everywhere. We've um, We've rejected offers in the past to, to, to buy our data uh, we, because we know it would disappear behind a paywall. Um, so it's, as far as we're concerned, well, I can only speak for the current committee anyway, but as far as we're concerned, that, that's, that's our ambition to, to maintain a free index. Newsflash. We're that close. <laughs> Less than 4,000 records, short of 4 million. It took us seven years to get our first million, that was 2005. So eight years, that's another 3 million records. So we've, we have sped up a little bit. We may, I normally update the, the website Saturday nights. Um, we may, just may, sneak in by tomorrow night. It all depends on what the index is supply in the next, today and tomorrow. I think it's, it's more likely it will be early next week that we, we, we get through the, through the four million mark. But you'll hear about it. Keep an eye on the Facebook page. <laughs> Keep an eye on the front page because once we get to four million, we'll do an update and have it up there. Okay, questions? Yes? If you were prepared to pay, would the newspapers transfer the uh, information across electronically? Is that do what it's manual? Um, so if we were prepared to pay is the big problem. They are staring at it electronically themselves. Newspapers these days create PDFs of every page that they print. They could. They could. Mm -hmm. We've tried. Mm -hmm. We've, we, don't, well, we, don't, we, we actually take the printed paper and we just, we just extract the bits we want. Yes. The, the name, the date, the location details, the age. That's a, that's a manual thing, that's right. 
That's right, that's right. Uh, but actually extracting that automatically out of a death notice is very difficult because the formats, the formats of notices are not consistent. And there we, well, that's, that's the one thing we can't do because we're building an index to avoid the copyright issues that we would have if we published the full so notice. You're just an index, you're not... Purely an index, yes. You won't find one notice on the website. It is purely an index to point you as a researcher to the place to go to find the notice. But I wonder, do the newspapers yeah. themselves have electronic indexes? Well, they have PDFs and the PDFs are searchable. I have been in the um, offices of one of the, I won't, I won't mention which one, but one of the, the newspaper, um, the large newspaper networks, and I have searched their, their um, PDFs and been able to extract whole runs of particular papers, just the death notice pages. It's quite possible to do it. But we, we approached one, one newspaper company to say, we, we, know you, we know we can do this, or we know you can do this, would you be prepared to give us access to the, the PDFs for the death notices? Oh, gee, nobody's asked for that before. Well, that'll have to go upstairs, won't it? Um, and about three months later, it ended up in the two hard basket upstairs. <laughs> so I'm not optimistic in the short term. It may happen at some stage, but we, we don't appear to have got the successful formula to approach them yet. But if anybody has any, any influence in Fairfax or News or APN, please come and talk to me. <laughs> Can I just mention that the State Library has all of the Queensland newspapers that are com currently being published. So when you have this urge to index, you can come in here and find them. <laughs> Even if they're not on microfilm, we've certainly got a number of them in hard copy. And I've been fascinated at why we've now got so many requests for the Northern Star, because we've got the Northern <laughs> New South Wales papers. And then we're always requesting that they come up from Cannon Hill. I now understand it. Um, someone asked me outside, do we have the current papers, things that are other than on trove? And yes, we do, either in hard copy or microfilm. And we do a two-hour search of newspapers as well. But, I mean, as John said, this could be your opportunity to expand your indexing opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It could be. Any other questions? Yes? In Stephanie's notes, she talks about the Gimpy Times and the Mary River Mining thing. Do they actually have booklets going back to the 1868, I think it was, up to 1909, just five or six booklets with the index and it's it's very hard to for us to um, to index from sources other than the original notices because our, our whole premise is that we have to have all notices for a particular day to put it onto Ryerson otherwise it makes a mockery of the the page that says which dates we've already done if we're indexing we, we, have, we have approaches, for instance, from society saying, we have a card index filed alphabetically of all the death notices from our local paper. It's really very, very difficult for us to use that because it needs to be in date sequence. They need to supply all the, day, day, all the names for one day at a time. So the only way that they could do it would be to give us the whole index. And so it, we, we could then sort on, on publication date easily, but it's a lot of work for them to put that index into the for, a suitable format, even, a even putting it into a spreadsheet if it's already on cards. And that's where a lot of these things break down. If someone's published half a dozen books of the Gimpy Times, um, it would probably be organised uh, to make it easy for searching by name, and that, that's not what we can easily use. Oh yes, yes. I should I should mention I should mention, the Maryborough Chronicle is complete on Ryerson from 1861. Yes, that was a group of people up there. Um, when I when I mentioned earlier, I was talking about it, the individuals that have gone back, um, but up at Maryborough there, were, there was a group of four or five indexes got together and said, okay, let's let's do this. 
we'll take the paper back to it started in 1861, and they did. It took about two years, three years maybe, but the paper is complete on, on Ryerson. St George Leader is another one. Um, the local society got behind that, um, though it only started in 1960, so it was a much easier job, but they, they have completed their, that paper as well. That's where we, we really like to have cooperation from societies because they can usually muster half a dozen members to do the work rather than just have one person doing the work. And when you've got half a dozen members, you can index a lot very quickly. So again, if you, if you belong to a local society and your, your paper is not in Ryerson or it's only incomplete in Ryerson, please raise it with your society. You know, are you interested in forming a little working party in the, in the society to index the paper for us? We'd love to hear from you. Are there any more questions? Okay, I'd okay. like to thank John very much. I don't think there could be any doubt that what he's doing is just <coughs> invaluable to all of us who are doing research. Um, it's a mighty job, and I can tell you if you've ever had to search for some of these records without that assistance, you really appreciate what is done. Um, what I would also like to remind everyone to do is to fill out their evaluation forms because we need your feedback so that we know what we should be doing right or wrong. But meanwhile I'd like us to thank John. Thank you.